Okay, everybody, we're gonna get started here. A lot of people today. Wow, look at all these people. Um, so welcome to uh, the first session uh, for 2020. This is part of our Sustain a What uh, workshop series. It's a monthly workshop series where we basically just show off cool things going on around the city or cool initiatives that we think you should be aware of. Um, they are the last Thursday of every month at 3.30. Uh, there are some. Ex there is an exception. We have the National Drive Electric Week EV Expo at 10 a.m. on September 27th at Manatee Sanctuary Park, where we show off hybrid and electric vehicles uh, that you can also test drive. So from local EV owners. Um, but this this workshop, uh, look ahead, future 2020 projects and beyond. We have a nice listing here of projects that we're going to be undertaking uh, this year in the city. And some of them are actually outside the city, but we thought you should be made aware of them given their regional uh, importance um, and their proximity to our city. Um, the list of projects on here are not all inclusive. There are more. Uh, we just couldn't fit it all in an hour. Um, if you want to see pretty much all the projects we have going on in the city, we have a web address for you at the end of the presentation that you can always go to that's updated weekly, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's where all the information that you, you um, hi Lisa, that you, no, it's okay, that you um, will see here came from uh, pretty much. And all the projects also uh, were either approved by the city council or in the city's uh, budget. And if anybody has any budget questions, we have the good book over there. <laughs> Stephanie's right. <laughs> so um, let's get started. Uh, I'm Zach Eichholz. I'm the city sustainability analyst. Um, we have Stephanie here. Hello, everyone. What do you do, Stephanie? I am the community affairs manager. I manage all of our social media, so I'm sure some of you have seen me online. I send out our weekly update every week, and um, I manage our website and most of our events. So thank you all for coming today. And then it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce to <laughs> you Jeff Ratliff our Capital Projects Director, he's sitting right here, who will also be giving some of the slides in this presentation as they uh, fall under his jurisdiction. He probably has some of the biggest projects on this list, so pretty cool. Um, we're gonna talk about sea oats uh, first. We have, um, I need your help. We have a sea oats planting coming up this Saturday, actually. This is, uh, that's what they look like. Um, there will be 10,000 of these delivered uh, from Brevard County. Uh, for us to plant on our beaches here. This year we will be doing them uh, across six beach crossovers uh, and then we'll be giving them to some additional communities as well. Uh, starting at Washington Avenue down to Jackson Avenue. We'll be meeting at Sherry Down Park at 8 a.m. and it goes to 11 but if hopefully if, if enough people show up We'll get done pretty quickly. Last year it went very quickly because we had close to 100 people show up, I think, which was awesome. Um, why do we do this? Uh, sea oats is a natural uh, or native plant, I should say. Um, they're extremely um, uh, critical in the in the protection of beach habitat and uh, sand dunes. Um, they when they grow, their root system basically act, acts as rebar would in a concrete building. Uh, growing four to six feet down below the sand surface and uh, basically keeping the dune system in place so that it can weather erosion better and uh, from wind and waves. And they also act as a sand trap when, wind, er, when sand blows across the beach, um, which can also raise the height of the dunes, which is something we like because it, it is that natural storm protection should there be, ever be a storm surge or some wind event. Um, so, uh, and it's just great public outreach too to get the, the neighborhood involved. Uh, they really do make a difference and we do it annually. We've been doing it since 2005. To date, we've planted over 100,000 sea oats. Whether or not they're all alive still, we don't know. But if you go out to the beach, you can see them between um, the sea grapes and the uh, ends of the dunes before the open beach starts. Um, so it's pretty cool. Oyster gardening, this one's gonna be fun. So this was supposed to start last year actually, but um, it's been delayed because the uh, people that provide the oyster spat, as it's called, spat is fancy word for basically baby oysters, um, is delayed. Uh, they're having some trouble cultivating the spat that's necessary for this project, which is orchestrated by the Brevard Zoo. 
This is under their Restore Our Shores program. This is completely free to the city. Um, all it really requires is the installation of these cages that you see here, which will hold oyster shells that the spat will be applied to, where they will be cultivated and grow over the course of six to nine months, at which point they'll be harvested, brought back to the zoo, and then be put into lagoon restoration projects um, across the county to build oyster reefs, um, which are also very critical in uh, habitat restoration and storm surge protection because they act as natural wave breaks. Um, it's also great public outreach. This program is free to anyone. Anybody that has a dock side, uh, or excuse me, a lagoon side dock, um, you can sign up for this. You have to take a class. I am the city's oyster gardener, uh, officially. I took the class and... Um, Ta-da! This is what they look like. <laughs> so these, these are examples of the oyster cages. Um, I don't remember if I said it, but they can hold 50 to 200 oysters a piece. We will have four of these under Banana River Dock, which is the city's public dock, um, which is actually pictured right there. Really good because it has that lattice uh, platform, so it's very easy to tie these underneath them. The only maintenance required for this is washing the oysters once a week, uh, dousing them with some fresh water, and then putting them back in. Um, they have cultivated thousands of oysters with this program for the last five years. Or, or uh, I think since 2014, actually. Um, so it's a really cool program. I highly encourage you to get involved. If you'd like to learn more or if you have a uh, doc um, or you know someone that has a doc, you can always get, get them in contact with me. My e email address is underneath there. Um, but yeah, one, the reason why we do this too is because one oyster, one adult oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day um, because they're filter feeders. So they also improve the water quality uh, around them. So that's pretty cool and a very uh, cheap way to help fix the lagoon, especially when you multiply these cages by hundreds. So. Where is that dock located? Banana River Park, which is up, um, it's on the northwest corner of the city by the Puerto del Rio Condominium Association. Um, if you take Therm or West Central Boulevard off A1A, it, and then we can show you on a map. I should have put a map, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know where Manatee Sanctuary Park is? Yeah. Okay, it's right north of that on the same road. Mm -hmm. Yep, right north of that. Past the soccer fields. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also a kayak launch there, too. There is. Yeah. What do we got next? Speech, beach, bubbles. Say that five times fast. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, saw this on social media. It was one of our most successful social media posts ever. Stephanie, how far did this get online? I can't. Far. Really far. I think it was our number one post from 2019. I think it got over 50,000 um, views. 50,000 sounds about right. Um, that's, that's no joke. Um, this is basically an outreach program and litter control awareness um, in kind of like a more fun, engaging way to just remind people that when they're on the beach, they should be taking everything with them and their trash. Um, we, this was actually uh, first seen on a beach that was in Europe somewhere, um, and then we took the idea, and we are in right now getting these made up into metal signs that are a little bit more durable that can actually go out onto the beach. Um, we got approval from the state to do this. Um, it, they'll be located next to uh, two of our Moby mats on Ridgewood and Polk Beach crossovers, um, since they're pretty highly traveled. Um, yeah, uh, they will be semi-permanent, so in the event of a hurricane, we will be able to take them inside, um, basically connected to a metal pipe that's cemented into a five-gallon bucket about three or four feet down and then just buried. Um, so pretty cool. Hopefully it works out really well. It gives a lot of good attention to a, a very important topic of waste and litter control, especially on the beach. So. 68,000. 68,000. <laughs> Pretty cool. These Very signs cool. that you see here are made of foam. Um, they were, they're, they're basically traveling signs just to gauge awareness of whether or not people thought this was a good idea. And we did take them around to several events and people did like it. So we're moving forward with some the semi-permanent options. 
new alternative fuel vehicle. Okay, so uh, we're adding this year a new uh, vehicle to our fleet. It is not this old rusty minivan. <laughs> uh, this is the vehicle that will be replaced. This is a 2007 Dodge minivan. It's got uh, just over 50,000 miles on it, and it looks at um, maybe it looks a little worse than 50,000 miles, but. Um, this vehicle is having some issues and really can't be driven anymore, so it will be replaced with the city's fourth alternative fueled vehicle. What I mean by that is a vehicle that is not solely powered by gas or diesel. Um, we are getting a RAV4 hybrid um, from 2019, which is the uh, actually best um, SUV for MPG on the market right now, uh, which, with over 41 miles to the gallon in a city environment. So over the costs, uh, or over the equivalent mileage of this car, the RAV4 will be saving us over $4,000 in fuel cost, um, and it will have lower emissions, which is always great. Uh, less maintenance costs too. Uh, hybrid and electric vehicles do have less maintenance involved since there are less moving parts. Re uh, the regenerative braking that these vehicles use to capture energy uh, and bring it back to the battery is actually less um, less intensive on tires and the braking system itself, so that's really cool. And the RAV4 looks like this. Like this, there. That's what it looks like. Hello. This vehicle um, will be in the Public Works Services Department. Um, it will be uh, used for stormwater inspections. And hey, how are you? Good afternoon. Um, uh, stormwater inspections, site visits, uh, things of that nature. A lot of like slow speed driving or idling, which is really good too because a hybrid switches to an electric mode. So it's not using any gas in those types of situations. So it's even more uh, cost saving. Um, but yeah, that's what we'll be using. Equipment transport, personnel driving around. Maybe they got to go to a different city. Uh, maybe they got to go to Cocoa Beach for something. So that is that. That will be the city's fourth alternative fueled vehicle in a fleet of 30 vehicles. Uh, that'll be the third RAV4 hybrid we have, and uh, the other one is a all-electric Ford Focus, which is actually parked outside this building. Did you want to mention the new-ish charging stations? The new-ish charging stations are right here. Um, there are four plugs total. Uh, they're level two chargers, so they use 240 volts. That'll charge an electric car from zero uh, so completely depleted in anywhere from 1 to 13 hours, depending on the make and model of the vehicle. Um, but they are right there. <laughs> so there's six now at City Hall. That's that. That one does not need to be plugged in. Wayfinding signs. Wayfinding signs, kind of like what it sounds like. These are new signs going out across the community that look like that. Um, basically, to improve directional signage we have for uh, residents and visitors, more community awareness. We do have people that come to us that, you know, they say, I don't know where this is. I don't know where that is. We have visitors that we want to, you know, make aware that we have these nice amenities like Manatee Sanctuary Park. Um, this is where the, uh, the fire station is. This is where the police station is. So these signs will do that very uh, directly. Um, and we have a map of where they are going right here. So each of these dots represents one of those signs that you just saw um, in, the other, in the other slide. So that's where they'll be going. Installation should be starting pretty much now, um, if not in the next few weeks. Um, and that will be done by Public Works. Is there a good street, a map of uh, Cape Canaveral? Yes. In what sense? We do have a lot of different types of maps that we could get. I, mean, I don't know where some of the things are. I don't even know where some of the streets are. Right? Oh, you mean like for like referencing where something is? Yeah. I believe we do. I can check for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Brenda makes our maps. She uses a program called GIS, uh, Geographic Information Systems. Um, and we're actually doing a lot of different types of map things. Uh, yeah, like we just, Jeff uh, mapped all the stormwater outlets where those go. Where all the, we have a map that shows where all the fire hydrants are in the city. So I will check. Thank you. Sure thing. Sorry, yes. I will also check. <laughs> Maps. Yes. <laughs> so we do have a um, kind of printout city road map that we can share. I can put it on our social media page if that's helpful for you guys. 
Okay. Do you want the signage maps too up there? Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. Hopefully these signs will work too, besides maps. Um, funny enough, we, Steph and yeah. I were just talking about <laughs> Map Mondays. Map Mondays <laughs> is a social media thing we want to start using, um, where we basically post a map of the city. And there's some, th something different about it every time. So one map will maybe show you where all the parks are. Maybe one map will show you where all the wayfinding signs are. Maybe one map will show you where the beach accesses are where the Moby mats are that you can take wheelchairs out onto, onto the beach. So that's something that we do want to start soon. Um, and we're just kind of banking those maps so we can have them ready to go one week after the other. So it's a good point. There are the promotional maps out in the lobby that mm -hmm. um, also have all the, uh, the places of interest. Um, I'm not sure if that would help you with common things, but um, if there's one of Cape Canal and the photo where it's Coco Beach or um, and that. Oh, the, the, the color ones in the corner, yeah. Right, thanks. Those also have those types of things on. Cool. Wagner Park expansion. Has anybody been to Wagner Park? Is that the one on the right line? It is. Oh, yeah. cool. No. no. <laughs> but you know about it. Yes. That's good. Uh, Wagner Park was a, a pocket park that we finished up <coughs> late last year. Um, it is getting an expansion, actually. Uh, the property was donated to us by the trailer park across the street, which is very nice. Um, but they also donated a small patch of land on the opposite side of the streets on, on their side, um, which would be on the west side of this park. Um, so that, that little patch is going to get developed basically just into another little sitting area. Um, this park was designed um, basically to become uh, an amenity for the East Coast Greenway Trail, I believe it's mm -hmm. called. Yeah. Uh, it's a bike trail that runs along North Atlantic. It's actually a part of a program that it runs the entire length of the United States on the East Coast from Key West to Maine. Um, and North Atlantic is designated as a part of that trail. So that's why it has a lot of bike amenities like uh, the water fountain, the peacock bike rack, the fix-it station, seating, um, and things of that nature. This is also a stormwater park, and what I mean by that is it can, it's designed to capture stormwater, which is any runoff that runs off of streets, driveways, sidewalks that doesn't get allowed to go down into the soil as it normally would to be naturally filtered. The water can run off the street there or the sidewalks and run through these rocks uh, and these native plants, they're all Florida native plants. Um, and even down through that black uh, uh, tarmac looking material, that's, that's not concrete, that's not asphalt, that's a material called flexi pave, which is actually made from recycled tires that is totally permeable. If you poured a uh, water bottle over it, the water would just disappear right through it. And then on the far left of that image by the fence, you can see a little depression. That's a bioswale um, with native plants inside of it, which is designed to hold water, keep it there, and let it filter down into the ground where where it would be uh, naturally filtered before just running off into um, a drain where it would get unfiltered going into the lagoon. So that's what this park does as well. Um, it's also designated as a monarch butterfly way station. Uh, if you go out there, I guarantee you, uh, you will see monarch butterflies. There are milkweed plants planted right in the middle of that little uh, island there. Um, I see them every time I go out there. So it's pretty cool to see that. There's also a little free library. Oh yeah, there is. That's going to be dedicated next Monday at two. If anyone wants to come. All right. Anybody else, like Cocoa Beach or Marin Island or Rockley, has something like this, right? I can't. I, do you know of any? Are we? We're pretty innovative here in Cape Canaveral. That's what I'm saying. I can't. I mean, we're. We try and be pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, please. Oh, wow, I forgot about this slide. This will show you actually where the expansion is going. That would be helpful. Uh, you can keep clicking, Stephanie. So there's the existing uh, spot of Wagner Park. It used to just be a parcel of land, empty land. 
And this is where the new part, the new section is going, that tiny little pad right there. There is a crosswalk too that will join them, and it will be getting those, um, I can never remember the acronym's name, but they basically blink when you want to cross the street, except these will be um, in ground. So it'll almost look like an airport runway, where you, uh, you, have, you know the little reflectors that you see on a roadway that light up when a, when a light is shined on them? These are, um, they look the same, but they have a small solar panel on the top and they have LED lights, so they blink on the bottom, uh, so it looks like the roadway itself is blinking um, whenever somebody presses the button. So that's what that crosswalk will have right there. Pretty cool. Flood barriers. Um, I hope Jeff comes back because his part's next. Um, so water reclamation facility, or WRF, um, we live in a very vulnerable location. We get a lot of hurricanes, we get a lot of rain. The water reclamation facility is located right next to the Banana River Lagoon. And in the past, it has flooded from hurricane events, one of the most recent being Hurricane Irma in 2017. Um, Traditionally, we sandbag the facility, any of the doors, the garages, whatever, to give that level of flood protection. That is not always guaranteed with a sandbag, because you can only make them so high, they get very dirty. If they do get flooded, they're usually considered toxic material once they do get flooded, for whatever reason, whatever's in the water, oils, things like that. Um, so instead of having to continually sandbag facilities, which takes hours, um, we thought maybe it'd be a good idea to look into getting these semi-permanent flood barriers that do not require sandbagging. And instead of taking hours to sandbag, um, these take about a minute to install once the hardware is placed on the door, which in and of itself takes about 10 minutes to, to install. And what I mean by hardware, I mean two guide tracks that get sealed to the door frame. And then this metal door, which is three feet tall, uh, which otherwise would be placed in storage when not needed, will be taken out and put in place and sealed with those screws, those little black screws that you see on top. So we got five of these to try out that will be put around the facility. Uh, three of them, no, I'm sorry, we got eight of them. Three of them will be going at the Public Works Services Administration Building, which is inside the plant, and then another one will be going, uh, the, the remaining five will be going at the lab building, where the facility has its testing lab for water quality, digester, conference room, and kitchen. And that's no coincidence, because that building becomes the, um, basically our headquarters in an emergency situation. That's where we go for whenever there's a disaster. We get allowed back into the city after a hurricane, the cross, the, the crossovers, the uh, causeways are opened, um, and we start doing uh, damage assessments and things of that nature. That's where we operate out of. So this facility is the one above all else that needs to be storm hardened and ready to go. And these flood barriers, I think, are a good way to start that. So these will be installed uh, sometime in the spring before hurricane season gets going on June 1st. That's the official day of hurricane season. I'm glad you brought that up. They can. These are available to any consumer. They, uh, you can literally pick them out from a website. They have different variations in height and width, um, including double doors. Uh, they have, sell some really big versions that can span like driveways. Um, or these, this is about as small as you can get um, in terms of width-wise. Um, and I believe they are customizable if need be. So. That's what that is. Jeff, I think it is your turn. Good luck. <laughs> Pierce. Oh, Pierce, yeah. Sidewalk. Yeah, everybody's favorite topic. Take this project way. actually started about a week ago. And the goal is to have a sidewalk on both sides of the street from A1A to the beach. And this is kind of the beginning of our sidewalk construction program. Uh, the ultimate goal is to have at least one sidewalk on every street in the presidential area. So in some cases, we'll have a sidewalk on both sides of the street. But in some cases, that's just not possible. So. Like I said, this has already started. This started about uh, 10 days ago. And we'll do hopefully a couple of these every year until we get them all knocked out. 
can I ask you about a specific sidewalk? You bet. What about across the street here in front of like Carter's Cove instead of that gravel? That's uh, on, on A1A? Right. That's a state road, so that's really a... The sidewalk, so the sidewalk's not... No. We really can't touch anything in the DOT right of way. That's, that's, yeah, that's another issue. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's been going on for 20 years. Well, that so, my life, my life. Uh, mine either, probably. Mine neither. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next is our wastewater treatment plan improvement project. This came in at about $1.3 million. Uh, this is just a general upgrade of the plant. Uh, it was built in 1966. It was upgraded in uh, 1995. So as you can tell, it's kind of due for another upgrade. But uh, we're gonna be putting in a lot of new monitors. It'll give us a real-time data for the operators. Uh, we'll be putting in what's called a carbon feed system, which will improve the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus content in our uh, effluent. So it's, it's almost a, a lagoon pro uh, project because our, uh, our reclaimed water will be cleaned up significantly. But that'll be starting here again too very shortly. Uh, we have a contractor on board. So probably in about two months we'll be starting this one. Next. Uh, Polk Avenue drainage improvements. Uh, this is a fairly simple project. Uh, this neighborhood floods even after a heavy thunderstorm. And it probably should have been taken care of a long time ago. But uh, we'll be changing the underground storage pipes. Uh, we'll be putting in new manholes. So hopefully it'll eliminate all this street flooding in this neighborhood. And there's actually a couple of houses that usually flood about once a year. So hopefully we'll be taking care of that also. And that's gonna start in about two weeks. So a contractor has been selected and uh, we're ready to go on that one too. Long Point Estuary Park. Does anyone know where this is at? The end of Long Point Road. <laughs> uh, this is an eight, eight acre property at the end of Long Point Road along the Banana River. Uh, the city's owned it since 1973. They really have never done anything with it. They just kind of sat there. And of course the pepper trees took over. <laughs> So the city got some grant funds from St. John's and uh, we've eliminated the pepper trees. And now we're gonna start some of the other phases of uh, turning this into a city park. And the first phase, we're gonna build a nice boardwalk from Long Point Road out to the Banana River. That's phase one. Uh, phase two will probably be a, a small nature center uh, with a parking area for six or eight cars. So we've really got big plans for this. Uh, we're going after a lot of grant funds on this, so it doesn't really impact you know, the local taxpayer. But we have, uh, we have big plans for this park. I think it's gonna be very nice. When's it supposed to be completed? We're working on some grant applications right now for the boardwalk. You know, the boardwalk's over a thousand feet long, so it's incredibly expensive. So we have to get some grant funds to cover the costs. And, uh, the application we're working on now is uh, due in March. So we should hear something probably in June, whether we get, that, get those funds or not. I think that's it for me. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Um, another cool thing I wanna highlight real quick. Did anybody see our video released yesterday on Facebook? No, that's okay. Um, we have a stormwater exfiltration system, which is basically underground tanks underneath the... Um, you were talking. I was talking. On the video. Yes. On the video. Cool. <laughs> um, these underground storage tanks 
they look like giant orange tubes um, underneath the Cape or the Canaveral City ball fields. Um, they hold 931,000 gallons of water, which is normally meant to be storm water. The system has recently been upgraded. Uh, it was built in 2016. It was recently upgraded to be able to handle reclaim water excess. So reclaim water is the water that you usually see being irrigated. Then you'll see the signs, don't drink the water. Um, that is the water that's treated from the from the wastewater reclamation facility over here. It used to be sewage. Um, now, a lot of the problems going on with the lagoon right now are nutrient pollution, right? That's the high levels of phosphorus and nitrogen from fertilizers and um, water reclamation facilities because they all have to dump. That's just a thing that has to happen if we want to have sewage, basically. Um, but you can do things to improve the amount of the pollution going in there. And with this system upgrade, we can pipe extra rec uh, reclaim water to the tanks under the park and have it naturally filtered through the ground because um, the Florida soil is very permeable and good at sucking up water. Um, where it would be filtered, as opposed to going directly into the lagoon, which is really good. Um, so that's something that we're working on to avoid those discharges. Um, that's something I just want to tell you guys. Pretty cool project. We can play the video at the end of this presentation. Oh, yeah. I love hearing myself talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question Does that mean that the city does not use all of the reclaimed water for, for residential irrigation? Mm -mm. That. Jeff, you want to answer that? Well, the only alternative is to put it in the Banana River, and that's what we do. Well, what I'm getting at is there any, any possibility of extending the reclaimed water system? Uh, that opportunity is there, but most residents are already hooked up. We're so not. We're not. We're not. We're not. We don't have it on the line. Yeah, we're on Oak Lane. We'd love to have you. Yeah. That. Well, there's plans for Oak Lane, and uh, I'm sure you're aware of them. We'd love to know more about that. Yeah, you should stop by sometime and we'll fill you in. Yeah, there, there's plans for Oak Lane. Re residents that aren't on it can opt into it. There is a cost associated with it. Um, I don't know that cost offhand, but... Um, it's like $400 to hook up. Yeah. And then there's a monthly fee. But, uh, yeah, to your point, the more reclaim hookups we can get is the less discharges to the lagoon, which is good. And that's why that system was upgraded to be able to have that extra 931,000 gallon capacity. Um, this building actually incorporates the same type of stormwater system, but it does not have a reclaim uh, holding capacity. That giant tank, Stephanie, you wanna go back one to that aerial photo? That giant tank you see there in the left of the image is the newest of tanks. Is that 2015, Jeff, around there? Yeah, 2015, it's 2.5 million gallons capacity. Um, so that really helped with that too. Basically, the more capacity you can have, the less chance you can have of having to discharge the lagoon. Um, so that's why that giant tank is there. To answer your question, though, we, we do have too much reclaimed water. And when these tanks are full, there's nothing else to do with it except, you know, pump it into the river. Yeah. Um, Cape Center. Uh, the Cape Center is, uh, or will, be uh, the 2.0 version of Old City Hall, which is this building right out here, um, which was built in the 60s. Uh, this building will be getting uh, top to bottom, basically, a redo. Um, to look something like what's in that rendering right there. I'm sorry I couldn't find a better one. Um, but this will be turned into our cultural and arts heritage and education center, a uh, place to go, to go for the community to show off the cultural and, and historical artifacts of the city. Uh, the canoe, for example, that's in City Hall right in this room on the other side of that door. If you haven't seen it, recommend. Um, it was the canoe that was washed up during Hurricane Irma. will be being transferred over to there. So it's just an example of one of the artifacts that will be uh, in this building. We also have classroom space um, for various multi-purpose educational platforms and um, for, for art classes, too, I think. Is there um, like pottery and stuff? That's what they're talking yeah. about. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, and one of the really cool things about this building is once it's built, it will, or uh, rebuilt, I should say, it will be one of the first uh, solar buildings in the city. Stephanie, press next, please. So 
this might be a little hard to read, but um, the little uh, rectangles that you see lined up next to each other in the middle of the red, yes, those, um, those are solar panels. These, uh, this array will have 33 kilowatts of capacity at peak hours with an estimated annual energy output of 38,129 kilowatt hours. Um, the money saved on this electrical, uh, or on electricity cost after 25 years of use will be $108,000 um, with CO2 safe center and then the building on the other side of that raised roof section is the city hall building. It's on both sides and their, their system is a 80 kilowatt system so it's a little bit bigger. When, this, uh, when the Cape Center solar array is pumping electricity out uh, during the day, it will be able to achieve 100% offset which is really cool. And then at night when the sun goes back down, it'll be sw switched back to the grid. But of course, nobody will be in the building, so you're not really using that much electricity. So it'll, it'll work out really cool. Next, please. What was the uh, projected cost in solar? The projected cost for this one is around $50,000. In solar? Mm -hmm. So. Is that just for the solar array, or is that for the entire renovation? That's just for the solar array. If you do want a cost for the, the renovation, I think it's in the, the book. What's the time? Uh, I believe bid will be going out uh, sometime between now and the spring. Um, and after that, I don't know how long that process will take, but hopefully ground, ground will be broken, or I should say rebroken uh, this year. So, 2020. And then we have uh, the multi-generational facility. Now this is a big project. Um, I Forgive me, I do not know the ins and outs of this project, so I have the contact info for the director on the bottom there if you do want to know about it, but I'm going to be highlighting the, um, the sustainability aspects of this project. You know, the multi-generational facility, which will be going in at Canaveral City Park, um, hopefully around the same time as the Cape Center redevelopment, uh, is an all-age communal multi-purpose health and wellness center um, we're really the only city in the county that doesn't have a building like this, so uh, it'll be nice to have this. And it'll also come with a general redevelopment of the park as well, um, with better event space, solar lighting, uh, things of that nature. A lot of festivals that usually happen right over here will be moving over to there since it's like a, a dedicated event space. Um, it'll have a gym inside, a basketball court, uh, things of that nature. Um, the electrical, or excuse me, the uh, gym equipment will be able to uh, feed power back to the grid, actually, which is really, really cool. Um, but like the Cape Center, this building will also be one of the first in the city to receive a solar array to offset energy costs. Um, Stephanie, if you want to go ahead. Oh, here's just a picture of where it will be going in relation to the park. You can click again. Boom. So it's in that general area. Can you explain where that is? Sure. Canaveral City Park is a few blocks over to the northeast of us right here. Um, probably probably like literally a two minute drive. Um, if we had a map, <laughs> we could show you exactly where it is. When I'm done with this, we can pull it up on the, uh, oh, you want to go get a map? We can, pull, we can pull it up on Google Maps for you. Um, it's very close, very close. Who's in charge of the in terms of the project management, or just he he kind of still does, I believe. Gustavo, he's also pretty much now that it's almost out to be ready to go bid. He's taking over a lot of those responsibilities, I believe. Yeah, and it will fall under his department, so he'd, he'd be a very good contact. Here we are. Here's Canaveral City Park. Go to the satellite view, Stephanie. That might be a little bit easier to see. Yeah, they're the two ball fields. So we're here, two blocks down, two blocks over, essentially. And it's very, the building will be in, in, in the heart of the community, which is pretty nice. It'll be within walking and biking distance of a lot of residents. Um, so. 
become a really good focal point. Next, please. So here's the, the statistics for the multi-generational facilities solar array. Larger than the Cape Centers, because it is a bigger building. Um, this one will be a 50 kilowatt system. Estimated energy uh, output 85,015 kilowatt hours. Um, money saved off electrical bills $242,525 after 25 years of use. Um, CO2 savings $2 million for uh, 44,268 pounds after 25 years. Wind rating, same, 160 miles per hour. Panel number, 160. Um, the estimated cost up front for this was 117,000. So we'll be making a lot back after that. The ROI on both of them is about 10 years. Um, so for about 15 years after, and 25 years is a conservative estimate for the lifetime of the array. It probably lasts close to 30, honestly. Um, but by that time, we probably want to replace it anyways because solar panel design would be probably so much more efficient, um, even more so than it is now. But um, we'll be, you know, 15, 15 or more years with reduced or no energy bills. So, next, please. Okay. Now we're going to move out of the city a little bit, but not by much. Um, Port Canaveral Terminal 3. This is a project we wanted to highlight because um, of its proximity to the city. Thank you, Jeff. Um, because of its proximity to the city and the economic impacts that it could have in terms of the amount of visitors that come here and tourists and whatnot. This is uh, Terminal 3 being built at Port Canaveral, so not within the city limits. It is a brand new cruise terminal. Um, which should be having its opening uh, in spring of 2020. I think I read just before this that they're looking to get it opened in June. Um, and it will increase uh, passenger capacity by a lot. Um, and it will be the home of the Mardi Gras, which is uh, Carnival's new uh, cruise ship. It's their first liquefied natural gas powered cruise ship, which is a significantly cleaner burning fuel source than the uh, bunker fuel that they use now, which is why you often see that black, yellowish smoke coming out of the, the smokestacks. Um, this will have half the emissions as normal ships do, almost no particulate emissions, which is really the dangerous stuff when it comes to air quality. Um, and the way they're going to refuel this thing is they'll have a uh, LNG bunker ship go up to South Carolina, fill up with liquefied natural gas, which is held at cold temperatures. Shipped down here, um, refill the ship when it's at port. The ship will go out, have fun. The, sh the bunker vessel to refuel it will go back up to South Carolina and repeat and do it all over again. So the reason that a lot of um, cruise ships and um, uh, shipping companies are using this cleaner fuel is because the International Maritime Organization has mandated better fuel um, or better fuel that has less emissions in it. Uh, starting this year. So they're scrambling to switch over, otherwise they do face penalties. Um, so that's part of that project. And it's looking real good. I went over there a few days ago. Uh, it seems to be almost finished, so I think they're about 70% 70, 70 complete right now. Next, please. I believe while they're docked. If you go to the next slide, Stephanie, I think I have a picture of it. So there's the ship. There's the vessel that will be used to refuel it. Um, it will, yeah, I believe it will be done in dock, but I can check for you. They, the port did put out a press release, like a nice like two-page PDF about how this works, because there are a lot of people asking, like, how does this work? What's the safety behind it? This, you know. Um, so we can get you that if you'd like. Um, it's, it's a very nice PDF. Uh, oh, and I think a good thing to say is uh, Canaveral Fire has been training mm -hmm. for this new fuel source. They um, also have a new fire boat specifically directed at this. Oh, very and you'll cool. see in the upcoming weekly update that comes out Monday, some pictures of the firefighters training, different scenarios, putting out you know, potential disaster fires. Next, please. Okay. 
Virgin Trains East Coast Railroad. Who's heard of this one? Okay, cool. This is a very big project for the state of Florida, and probably for the country, I would argue. Um, this will be the first private railroad in a very long time in the United States. Um, a lot of you might be thinking Amtrak. Amtrak is a government um, com private or government company, basically. I don't know how best to put that. Um, but this is a completely completely private funded railroad. Uh, it was called Brightline up until very recently. Now I think it's officially become Virgin Trains mm -hmm. USA. Um, owned by Richard Branson, who's the one that owns Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Galactic, the private space corporation. Um, he, he doesn't entirely own Virgin Trains. He actually uh, negotiated a deal where they're licensing the name Virgin oh, and did. using him as the face of the company to promote its success. And it actually is the largest construction project in the United States right now. Really? Yeah. Private construction project. I wish I. That's Pretty great. crazy. I think uh, four billion dollars is Sounds what the right. price tag is right now. So if any of you have driven on 528 heading west um, to Orlando, you will have noticed probably by now massive construction project going on. That is this railroad. Um, right now it currently runs from uh, Miami International Airport to the city of West Palm Beach which are those three dots uh, in the lower part of the state right there. The second phase expansion, which is what you're seeing under construction right now, brings the line all the way up to Orlando International Airport, where they have actually finished the station um, and are starting to lay track work there. Uh, I think it's the first place in the phase two expansion where track has actually gone down. Um, it's part of their new Terminal C construction. Mm -hmm. Really cool fact about the steel. All the steel being used for the expansion of the railroad is 100% recycled. That's pretty cool. Um, and they do expect uh, that this will take three million cars off the Florida roads. I hope that holds true. Um, so this is part of a, a larger plan too to extend the railroad to stops like uh, Walt Disney World, which is in uh, high level negotiations right now to try and get a stop, probably, probably will. And then as this map shows, go on towards Tampa. They also have plans to go up towards Jacksonville. Um, so continue the line straight up east. There are plans, but not within the next few years, to have a station in Bavar County. Right now, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. Coco and Melbourne are the big candidates to get this proposed station. Other stops along the way might be Fort Pierce. Um, Boca Raton has uh, officially been confirmed to get a station. I think Aventura and Port, Can uh, excuse me, Port Miami, not Port Canaveral. Um, so, but that is not expected to happen at least within the next five years in our area. The line itself should be seeing rail service daily by 2022. Um, they're building at least uh, four different bridges out west from 528. Um, I think a tunnel's even being built mm -hmm. uh, under 95. Yep, so it's going to run the north part of 528 until it hits 95. Okay, and then it's going to go over 528 to the south, and then, or wait, wait, under 528 and over I-95, and then it will continue running west to the airport, because the airport lies south of 528 crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, will be, there will be sections of the line where trains will travel over 100 miles an hour. Um, they do expect a passenger to be able to uh, get off a plane in Orlando, get on the train, and be in Miami within three hours, which is a lot better than a car. Um, but yeah, that's what, that's what this is all about. Big, big thing for the state. Um, so we'll see how that continues to unfold. Next, please. I'm all for, I'm all for this stuff. Virgin Trains is uh, also breaking ground in a rail service out in Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, so their business is expanding. I guess something's working for them. Yeah, they're um, going to do a Las Vegas to Los Angeles line. Oh, wow. Yeah. Their high speed rail uh, is probably long overdue in the United States. A lot mm -hmm. of other countries do it very well. Um, there's a, group, a separate group out in Texas trying to build a high speed line. Um, and then I know Amtrak uh, is trying to get more uh, better, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, they're uh, redeveloping a lot of their northeast corridor with their Accela train, which is an electrified train that, that has that uh, cable on top. 
So train travel is coming back, um, and Florida is right in the middle of it. You can follow us um, on any of these social media platforms. The weekly update is um, an update that comes out weekly every Monday, um, which Stephanie sends out. Mm -hmm. um, revised. It is revised. Next. <laughs> Okay, so that web address I told you about in the beginning of the um, the uh, presentation, that link right there will get you to a uh, constantly updating list of city projects. All the projects that you pretty much saw are on that, except for a few, um, like Oyster Gardening's not on there. But uh, I guess, Stephanie, are you going to that? Yeah. yeah. October to October? Mm -hmm. October 1st to September 30th. Yes, thank you. You're right. Show them. Uh, like I said, a couple of them are going to start here, you know, in a couple of weeks. Uh, most of them, most of them are budgeted, yes. Okay. Does budgeted and funded mean the same thing? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me put it like this: they're budgeted, but we continually go after grants and things of that nature. So, who actually funds these can change. But right now, these are these are all a go. Yes. Do you know anything about the aquarium? Oh. Update on the aquarium. Do you have I can. Yeah. So the aquarium is vying for space in the port on the Banana River. That's where they want to go. The port is has not committed to that yet. Um, it is very much an active project. It is very much a community-based activism project. They are trying to get the community to rally rally around them for supporting it. Um, there are several different locations that have been proposed, one of which is the old Cape Canaveral Hospital. As you might know, they are, Cape Canaveral Hospital is relocating, um, and so the old hospital grounds will be available, and that's one of the proposed spots. Um, the Brevard Zoo has been very, very adamant um, trying to you know, get, um, get the community to do what they did when they first started the Brevard Zoo, and that was entirely based um, from community activism to get that up and running. So they're trying to recreate that, that sort of community unity to get the aquarium here. Um, Cape Canaveral has no committed funding to this. So we are not involved in any way except for um, supporting the project in its entirety. So um, not fiscally. Did you have any more specific questions around it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, this is the web page that has all the projects. Uh, each of those links uh, or those tabs is expandable um, or with a little drop down. So you can just choose whichever one you want and it gives a little blurb about it. And it's updated weekly, as I said. Mm -hmm. And I did want to show you that video. Let's see if I can log in. You can show them my video? If I can get, if I can get on the Facebook, <laughs> this is a shared community. You ever not like to watch yourself in a video? <laughs> While she's doing that, the next uh, workshop we're going to be having is on uh, February 27th, which is a Thursday at City Hall here. It's at 3:30 p.m. Uh, it's an hour time slot like this one. Um, this one is about community gardening. The city does have a community garden, if you didn't know. Uh, it's near Long Point Road, uh, adjacent to Patriots Park. Um, it's doing very well. It's uh, completely full. It's got uh, 10 gardeners right now across 12 plots. Um, and we'll also be talking about native planting. Um, so we're, we're trying to get somebody here from IFAS um, to come in. They're, they know everything about anything plants. Um, to come in and show you guys native, why native planting is so important and why the city is trying to do it a lot, uh, as we did with Wagner Park. So hopefully she'll bring some in too. Um, and then after that we have sea turtles and local wildlife showcase. Oh, here's the video. Let me make sure I can get it to play sound. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, that will showcase upcoming launches for the year, in this case, 2021. Mm -hmm. There's me, but you can't hear me. Lisa. It's not going to play sound, but I can certainly send out the link to anyone who'd like it. I can but narrate you can it. See, you can see, in the, yeah, there you go, in the pictures you're looking at. I can looking. narrate it. <laughs> Basically. Why don't, you, why don't you narrate it? There we go. We'll start Basically, from the beginning. Yeah, okay. Basically what I'm saying um, is, hi, I'm Zach Heikholz, and I'm the city of Cape Canaveral sustainability <laughs> analyst. <laughs> And today we'd like to tell you about a project that we're really proud of. This is the stormwater exfiltration project, which is underneath the Canaveral City Park ball fields, which was built in 2016. Those are those orange underground uh, stormwater chambers I spoke of that hold 931,000 gallons of stormwater, um, which is equivalent to, uh, or it has a catchment area of about 30 acres. Um, so this was built, those are the ones under City Hall in that particular photo. Um, this was built in the place of a traditional stormwater pond. So a lot of lakes that you see around, uh, if you've ever been out to the avenues in Vieira, there's big lakes around them. Those lakes are to capture stormwater runoff because it's all those uh, that paved surfaces. So that's what this system is doing. There's our water reclamation facility on the Banana River Lagoon. Um, there's that 2.5 million gallon tank I spoke of. Um, this is the facility that pumps the reclaimed water out to the city and to the uh, exfiltration system under Canaveral City Park. Um, the down, this shot is trying to indicate that the downspouts of City Hall, they disappear into the ground. They are disappearing to filter into those tanks. So that's where they're going. And that's pretty much what's going on. There you go. Cool shot. <laughs> yeah, very good shots. Good drone footage. If you haven't seen the video of the water reclamation reclamation facilities um, tour on our YouTube channel, you should check it out. It's a really, really educational video. It kind of explains the process um, from the time you flush until the water becomes almost potable. Yeah. It's very, very interesting, something I never knew anything about, so super educational. Thank you for asking where Banana River Park is. That's this park here. Okay, here's the head of the Here's the Banana River. Here's the plant. Thank you. There it is. Are there any plans for a piece of me that's a miniature golf place across from there? There are. But I don't really know that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a multi-use facility probably going in there where it'll have stores and shops on the first floor and like floors two through five will be apartments. Right. I believe that's the plan for that project. It's like a mixed-use building. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any more questions before we wrap up? It is 4.30. You're always welcome to come up after to talk to us. About um, Vanity Park. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that there's been a lot more, um, I guess you could say, improvements happening there. There's uh, I think that we saw like the bike, um, all the different tools. The fix it station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, and then also the, um, the bikes that they put there to the rest. The Zagster. Yeah. Is that, is that, are you, or is the city in any way incorporating um, any sort of, um, Facility where the crew and then uh, you can do an excursion, or in the city and the port have any kind of um, cooperation? Like that, where they're you know, like you come in from uh, and you can do an excursion and it goes specific place, like no too far or something in Cape Canaveral. Is there anything along that? Any kind of cooperation between port and city? Not to my knowledge, no. Mm -mm. To your point about the bike share program, um, the, they tried to get one at the port, but for whatever reason that fell through. Uh, we have three of those stations in the city. One is at that park, one is right here. Uh, if you will go out the store, you can see it. And then another one is at Canaveral City Park, where the multi-generational facility will be constructed. Um, and between them, there's over two dozen bikes. Uh, and then that system connects to Cocoa Beach, which also has additional stations. Um, 
there are some plans to try and get more in the city, um, but to get, uh, they need to be sponsored. So we're trying to get some other sponsorship, you know, community input and uh, outreach to see if anybody would like to do that. Um, no promises, but at least trying to get one more station in the city somewhere. So. I'm at Park probably every day, and I've noticed a significant increase in not only people, but um, uh, foreigners. So I'm assuming that people are coming there specifically from cruises um, and visiting and then going back. So I just didn't know if there's anything in the works to collaborate something like some type of excursion from the port and bring people into the city. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, not not right now, no. But it's nice that you see that. There, there are plans to uh, probably build a fishing pier and maybe a kayak launch at Manatee Sanctuary Park. Okay. Hmm. They're conceptual right now, but that's probably going to happen within the next five years. That's part of the kayak trail. Yes. Yeah, where we basically build a series of city-owned docks along the west shore of the city that would hopefully start at that aquarium, mm -hmm. which would be... Right up here. Yeah. You know, and then you would be able to make your way down, stopping at Banana River, Manatee, Long Point, um, uh, maybe uh, Central? Center Street. Center Street, thank you. Um, and then continuing down through to Cocoa Beach. That's another project in the wish list. Is there any possibility of getting garbage cans on the beach? Oof. I think Cocoa Beach has. We have garbage at each beach end. We don't want to put them on the beach because we have high winds and they just blow garbage down the beach. They, they literally have them on the beach? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Like two poles. Can I give you my card and uh, take a picture if you live there by, by any chance? Cause I'd, like to see, I'd like to see that. I believe they're anchored, like what you were talking oh, about. Oh, are they? The signs, I believe they're anchored down into the sand and attached. Okay, cool. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.